Hello and welcome everybody to Lecture 5 in Environmental Science 345, Climatology. This time we're going to be looking at the role of water in Earth's climate system. And looking at the big picture here, we start with different ways to describe water in the atmosphere, also known as humidity. There are different ways to express the idea of water or humidity into the atmosphere, more than just that classic relative humidity, which you see on your apps or, or sometimes here in weather broadcasts. Take it further to see how air becomes saturated, and saturated air is what we call clouds. Basically, you've got liquid water droplets or ice crystals suspended in the air, and that's clouds. And then once you have enough of that in a cloud, you ultimately get precipitation. So we'll look at forms, uh, the formation and types of precipitation. So we start with the overall global water cycle. Probably does not surprise you that the ocean is the largest reservoir of water on Earth, accounting for about 97% of all water on Earth. And the global water cycle is this ongoing and, and ceaseless movement uh, of water between the atmosphere, the ocean, terrestrial, biosphere, all on a planetary scale. Uh, so beyond the ocean, what's in second place regarding where the, the water is stored on Earth is in ice sheets and glaciers. There's a little bit in groundwater and, and lakes and inland seas and soil moisture and some that's permanently locked into the atmosphere. But after ocean, most of it is in ice sheets and in glaciers. As we talked about last time, the incoming energy from the sun is the real driver of energy on Earth, the initial input to energy on Earth. So no surprise, the sun is what's actually driving the global water cycle. Sometimes you hear it called the hydrological cycle as well, hydro meaning water. But it's that classic three-step process that you probably remember from grade school. It's evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Now, the evaporation can happen off of any number of surfaces, but it's largely oceans, lakes, rivers, streams, but some of it is out of groundwater, some of it is out of soil moisture as well. Uh, another process is called transpiration. In fact, evapotranspiration is that process where plants are bringing in water through the soil, through the roots, and they leaf out, and then they do their photosynthetic process and that water vapor back into the atmosphere. And that's a really big issue, especially uh, getting into the summer. As we mentioned last time, there is this transfer process between the, the Earth's surface and the atmosphere via phase changes in water, that evaporation, condensation, uh, but also sublimation, deposition, and then the transpiration as we talked a, a little bit before. The global water budget is, if you will, a big balance sheet for the inputs and the outputs of water to and from these various global reservoirs. And we think about a reservoir as being a, a, a big body of water, but the ice sheets are a reservoir. The oceans are a reservoir. Lakes are a reservoir. Uh, you can think of these in terms of volume or in terms of depth as well. So here are a few ideas or, or, or areas to show you uh, what's the average annual depth uh, of liquid water. And globally, it's on the order of about 828 millimeters. Don't fret too much about the specific numbers on this, but it gives you the idea of, of just how much uh, water is out there. Another big thing is humidity when we talk about water. And humidity is a basic word. It is a generic word for moisture in the atmosphere. There are lots of terms that uh, go around humidity, like relative humidity is one you're probably most familiar with, but that's a very specific kind of way to express moisture in the atmosphere. And uh, so let's, let's step back a little bit and talk about how many ways there are to describe the amount of water vapor in the air. So when we talk about humidity, we're talking about water vapor. And remember that water vapor is invisible gas. Water vapor is not clouds. Now, there is water vapor within the clouds, but the visible clouds themselves are made out of liquid water droplets 
and or ice crystals. All right, water vapor is invisible. Now, the amount of humidity that's going to be in the air varies tremendously, tremendously from season to season, sometimes from one day to the next, and, and certainly from one place to the other. For a lot of true scientific purposes, the water vapors in the atmosphere is expressed as vapor pressure. So if you think about the molecules of, of gas in the atmosphere, Remember, most of it's nitrogen and oxygen, nitrogen N2, oxygen O2, those molecules running around in the atmosphere. Water vapor, H2O, that's a molecule running around the atmosphere. So they're each bumping around and putting pressure on, on a surface. You know, molecules bounce around, they put a little pressure on a surface. So the partial pressure from water vapor is known as the vapor pressure. So the air pressure at a given location can be thought of as the total weight of the atmosphere over a specific unit area. You've got the partial pressure of nitrogen, you've got the partial pressure of oxygen, and you've got the partial pressure of water vapor. But remember, water vapor is a trace gas, so that's very, very small compared to the partial pressures of both nitrogen and oxygen. Saturated air is air that is basically at its maximum humidity uh, for that temperature. So water molecules are in, in this constant state of flux between liquid, solid, or, or vapor processes. There's, there's always this transfer going back and forth between solid and liquid and liquid and gas. All right, But the, the equilibrium, if you will, of, of that uh, of that phase change is taking place when the air is, is saturated. Now, eventually, liquid water becomes vapor at the same rate that water vapor becomes liquid. So there we say the air is saturated with water vapor over a surface. Now, it's a little bit different over liquid water versus ice. All right, so because the, the molecular structures, the molecular bonds are a little bit different in ice versus water vapor, right? But some of the terms you'll hear, uh, equilibrium vapor pressure, saturation vapor pressure, those are pretty much one and the same. But, you know, saturated air is basically, that's as much, that's as much water vapor you can evaporate into the air uh, before you start having a net return of that water vapor as liquid back down to the surface. So remembering that temperature is a function of energy. As you raise the temperature of air, you have higher energy air. So as a result, there can be more evaporation into the air, right? So if you raise the temperature of the air, you're allowing more potential evaporation into it. That doesn't mean it's automatically evaporated into it just because it's warmer but increases that saturation vapor pressure or the equilibrium vapor pressure, all right? So another way to think about this is, is warmer air tends to hold more water vapor, if you will. The reverse is also true. Lowering the air temperature reduces the saturation vapor pressure, all right? So the, the cooler the air is, the less moisture uh, it can hold. That value of saturation vapor pressure or or how much moisture, how much water vapor the air can hold goes up very, very rapidly with temperature. So that middle column there is the saturation vapor pressure over water, all right? The far right is over ice. We're not gonna fret about that too much because you know, most of us are living at temperatures that are above the freezing point of water. Um, but if you look in, in the column on the left, that's going by fives, 50, 45, 40, 35, then look at that middle column, the saturation over, over water. That's not going at the same rate, all right? As, that, as those temperatures go up, the saturation vapor pressure over water goes up dramatically. Look at the difference there between uh, in the temperature, um, zero and 10 Celsius, 32 and 50 Fahrenheit. 
the the difference in, in saturation vapor pressure over water is basically six to twelve all right so it, it doubles all right but it goes up much faster than that in the in the incremental five degrees celsius uh, intervals after that so for example we saw let's go from from zero to 10 c you're increasing six millibars of partial pressure saturation vapor pressure over water so it's a unit of six you increase your temperature 10 degrees you have a unit of six increase here in the saturation vapor pressure but then go another 10 from 10 to 20 it doubles from 12 to 24 it doesn't go up six it goes from six times two basically 24. so it tends to to double for every 10 degrees celsius a back of the envelope calculation if you will for for every 20 degrees increase in temperature or right, you're doubling the amount of water vapor you can put into the atmosphere so it is actually much more humid on a typical summertime day than it is in the dead of winter because of this relationship here this takes us back to relative humidity because it's relative to temperature. That's what the term relative means. It's a humidity relative to temperature. It compares the actual amount of water vapor in the air with the amount of water vapor that will be present if that same air were saturated. So that's why it's exp exp expressed as a percentage. When the air is saturated, it's 100%. And that's going to vary inversely with temperature. So your body doesn't really respond to relative humidity as much as it does the vapor pressure, the actual molecules bouncing off of you. The relative humidity doesn't have anything to do with the, the physical exact number of water molecules running around the atmosphere. Relative humidity is telling you more about the temperature and the humidity together. Now, vapor pressure is used for scientific purposes, but for most weather purposes, you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear the dew point temperature. This is the, the figure that meteorologists will, will preach about, including myself, way more than relative humidity. So what is it? It's the temperature at which the air must be cooled, technically at constant pressure, to become saturated without adding more water vapor or taking it out. Okay, so let's say that the temperature outside is 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the dew point temperature is 45 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. If the air were to cool to 45 degrees, then you would start getting saturation. Dew would form on surfaces and clouds would tend to start to form uh, in the atmosphere. doesn't mean it's going to rain, but it does mean your atmosphere has started to reach saturation. So, you're going to start having condensation taking shape in the atmosphere, thus forming clouds. So if your temperature is 50, dew point's 45, your relative humidity is up in the 80s percentage, but you're not at saturation. Remember that percentage, that relative humidity is telling you a percentage of how close you are to being saturated at a specific temperature. The dew point, even though it is expressed as a temperature, is independent of the temperature. It tells you what the temperature has to be for that air to be saturated. Technically, uh, if that temperature is below freezing, it's called the frost point. I don't know anybody who uses that term. Dew point's fine. Precipitable water. This is another measurement of water in the atmosphere. And this is more through the, through the depth of the atmosphere. When we talk about the dew point temperature, when we talk about the vapor pressure, those are, are values that we think about here at ground level in the bottom few hundred feet of the atmosphere. The precipitable water is the depth of water that will be produced of all the water vapor in a vertical column of the atmosphere, all the way to the top of the atmosphere, were suddenly condensed into liquid water. So let's say that my precipitable water was 1.5 inches. What does that mean? Well, that means if I took a chunk of air from the ground all the way to the top of the atmosphere, I took a column of that, and I took all that water vapor and 
condensed it out, how much of a liquid pile of water would I have left? All right, so the, the dew point temperature, we think about that as, as one spot here on the ground. Precipitable water, we're looking at through the whole depth of the atmosphere, taking all that water, squishing it down to liquid, and that's that value. And during the winter time, that, that's generally below an inch. During the summertime, that could be more than two inches. All right, so you're taking all the water vapor through a column, condensing out, and this is how much liquid you'd have at the bottom. So let's think about that value in the summer versus winter, the total column of that precipitable water. So this is the, the monthly average value. And for here, let, let's just focus on this, this red and orange area here. So this is July, so summer in the Northern Hemisphere. All right, you see the, this orange band here, and you have greens and yellows here in the northern part uh, of the Earth, of the Earth, and then dark blues down here towards Antarctica. So these blue values are very low, very low precipitable water through the depth of the atmosphere. Reds are the highest, and it may not surprise you that here in the tropical parts of the world, just north of zero degrees on the of the equator zero degrees latitude, just north of that where it's summer, that's where you're going to have slightly higher amounts, all right? But then if you come down to the southern hemisphere summer, which is our winter, all those all those blues have now shown up here in, in Russia, North America, and certainly the Arctic, all right? So it's colder, so there's less water vapor in the atmosphere because it's colder. I mean, Antarctica down here is always cold. Right. But if you look at North America here, all the blue showing up compared to the summer, we've got these reds and, and yellows and greens. This shows you that on average, during the summer, there is far more water vapor through the depth of the atmosphere than there is during the winter. That's part of the reason we can get thunderstorms in the summer. And it's not impossible to get them during the winter, um, but that's why they're a lot more common in the spring and summer. How to figure out how much water vapor in the atmosphere is done in a couple of ways. First one is a, is a hygrometer. Uh, it measures the water vapor concentration of the air, and there are a few ways to do this. One's a dew point hygrometer. That's the one that's, that that's, was used most frequently. Hair hygrometers, which are almost never used anymore. They actually use human hairs and how much they stretch. You know, if you've ever heard the bad hair day, because it's more humid, that's where that's coming from. Or the electronic hygrometers. Um, the old days, a sling psychrometer was used, uh, where you would have uh, a thermometer on, one, on, on, on two sides of a sling, and one of them was dry. The other one had a little piece of cloth. You put it over top of the bulb in the, uh, on the other thermometer. And then you would sling it until the temperature on that wet bulb stopped cooling because evaporation is a cooling process. So you keep slinging that psychrometer in the air until the temperature drops as far as it's going to drop on that wet bulb. All right. So the difference between that dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature is known as the wet bulb, depre uh, wet bulb depression. It doesn't get used as much anymore, but it, but it's but it's an interesting. It was an interesting way to to come up with how much moisture is in the atmosphere by determining how much I could evaporate using that sling psychrometer. So once we get to saturation, that's when we start making clouds. And so how do we do that? How do we cool things enough to get clouds to form? Right. This goes back to that, that psychrometer table I said before to, to give you an idea what the wet bulb depression is and the dry bulb temperatures are, just to, to have an idea. So you can look at that on your own time. Now, how does this air become saturated? Condensation or sometimes deposition right, becomes more likely as a relative humidity gets to 100%. And that's what's going to produce clouds. And the definition of a cloud uh, is it's a visible manifestation of water in the atmosphere. An aggregate of either tiny water droplets mixed with or 
ice crystals suspended in the atmosphere. So clouds are made of liquid water droplets or ice crystals or both. They need to be visible. Again, water vapor is not visible. So the relative humidity of unsaturated air will increase a couple of ways. So we're, we're trying to get the relative humidity up. We're trying to approach saturation. If you start to cool the air, like I said before, temperatures 50, the dew point temperature is 45, and you start cooling the air, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, the relative, I mean, excuse me, the temperature and the dew point temperature match, your relative humidity hits 100%, and then you get saturation and clouds form. All right. The other way you can do that is to add water vapor to air at a constant temperature. We actually see this a fair bit during the winter when you're adding water vapor in from the south. Um, we talked about advection where the air is coming in from some other place. You can have moisture coming in from a different source. A lot of times it's in the ocean the winds will shift off of the water and bring in water vapor. You know, there's going to be more water vapor to start with over an ocean than over land. So you start bringing in water vapor to a constant, to a place that has a constant temperature. That's going to change the relative humidity because you're adding water vapor. So that's the other way you can start to approach saturation. And that's when we'll start to see fog developing. Uh, you can expand the air. Expansional cooling is a gas or a mixture of gases expands. Its temperature decreases. As air rises, it cools and expands. Right? The reverse is true as you compress. As the air comes down, it's compressed and its temperature increases. All right? So that's when you actually lose saturation. You start moving away from saturation. That's why when the wind is from the northwest in Lynchburg and areas eastward to the Chesapeake Bay, um, it tends to be a little sunnier during the winter than back into the mountains, right? Because the primary wind is from the west or northwest. And as that air goes up the western side of the Appalachians, it cools and forms clouds. That same air then descends the eastern side of the Appalachians. It warms, humidity drops, relative humidity drops. All right, and as a result, you start to have uh, a clearer sky. So this expansional cooling, compressional heating or warming uh, are, are processes that are called adiabatic. Uh, a diabatic or adiabatic process is a process where you're adding heat to a system. So an adiabatic process means a process that is not adding heat to the system. All right, so in other words, uh, the, the cooling and warming is taking place without a bunch of influence from the sun. All right, there's no real heat exchanged between one little chunk of air and the air that surrounds it. This ascent and descent of air through the atmosphere, when there's not saturation involved, is known as a dry adiabatic lapse rate. And it's about 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So if you have air that doesn't have enough moisture in it to become saturated, and that air is lifted for whatever, however you want to lift it. And most of the time we think about air going up a mountain, that you have to lift the air there. For every thousand meters it goes up, it cools just under 10 degrees Celsius. So that's the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Same thing in reverse. If that air comes down a thousand meters, it's going to warm almost 10 degrees Celsius. Now, if you do hit saturation, that changes the game. Because remembering that condensation uh, releases heat, it's a heating process. So that temperature drop will not be as as strong. So instead of cooling at a rate of 
degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. It cools at a rate of 6 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. All right. Again, condensation is a heating process. So you're still cooling as it goes up. You're just not cooling as rapidly because condensation is a heating process. So that also has to be incorporated into the, into the calculation. And this is a graph you can look at a little bit more closely with, with the notes, but the idea here being the one on the left, you know, you've got temperature in degrees Celsius from zero to 40, and you got altitude in meters. So if you're starting here at 30 Celsius, 86 Fahrenheit, and this little chunk of air starts to go up, it's cooling at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So by the time it goes up two kilometers, it's cooled almost 20 degrees. But then it's probably risen enough and cooled enough, and there's probably been enough moisture in the atmosphere that it's reached saturation. Remember, you cool it, and then it will reach saturation. So it's probably cooled enough, 20 degrees of C cooling is a lot of cooling, that it will reach saturation. And if it keeps going up, it will continue to cool, but it won't cool as fast anymore for the same rate of going up at 6 degrees C per 1,000 meters. So dry air, as it rises, it cools very quickly. Then once it hits a saturation point, it cools enough to saturate. It can still rise and still cool, but it won't cool as fast anymore because the condensation releases heat into the atmosphere. So the pace at which you're cooling as you go up slows down a little bit. Now, the other thing we have to look at is the atmospheric stability, and that goes back into this into this graphic here. The air will rise as long as the air that surrounds it is cooler. So what do I mean by that? So walk through this. The, compare the temperature change of ascending or descending air. And we'll think about a little parcel or just a little chunk of air, all right, with the ambient air, the air that's around it. All right, so if I have a piece of air and that air starts to rise, okay, let's say it goes up 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 3,000 feet. As that air goes up, it's cooling. But what about the air that's already in place around it? All right, let's say that there's winds of two, three, 4,000 feet in the atmosphere coming from a certain direction. That's changing how, that's changing the, the overall temperature profile vertical temperature profile of the atmosphere, all right? Because the wind isn't going to be the same direction at all heights in the atmosphere, even over the same spot. So let's take a look, consider this graphic right here. We've got temperature on the, the horizontal, we've got altitude in the vertical here, all right? And let's look at this tiny little circle in the middle. That's a little chunk of air, all right? So the temperature changes with height when the air is colder than the air that surrounds it it rises so if you if you take that little chunk of air and force it up in whatever shape or form and the air that it's going into is cooler than its surroundings that's unstable that means it will continue to go up if you think about a hot air balloon uh, if you have hot air little hot air balloon with relatively cooler air around it, it goes up. It's positively buoyant, but it works in reverse as well. If the air parcel is warmer than its surroundings, you get the opposite. So with the unstable layer, the air is warmer than its surroundings. If it's a stable layer, it is cooler than its surroundings. If you think about it, if you were to suddenly have a reverse of a hot air balloon, you put a bunch of cool air into a balloon and you put it into a hotter atmosphere around it, it would sink. All right, so stable atmosphere. If you were to take a little piece of air and try to force it up and the air around it was warmer, that means that little piece of air is cooler and it's going to sink. All right, if it's unstable, that little chunk of air that it gets pushed up and it's cooler than its surroundings, Air around it is warmer, 
it's going to rise further, so that's unstable. So, as a general rule, an air layer becomes more stable when it descends and less stable when it ascends. That kind of follows. Now, because moisture is involved, water vapor is involved, there are two levels of stability. There's absolute instability, meaning the temperature of the, of the air drops more rapidly with altitude than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. All right, so the ambient air will be unstable for both saturated and unsaturated air parcels, which means that I got a little piece of air and I'm forcing it up, whether it is saturated or unsaturated, it's rising, all right? That means it's absolute. No matter, no matter how much moisture is in your little chunk of air that you're forcing up, all right, it's still going to be cooler in surroundings. Because remember that it's not cooling as fast when it's saturated. When it's dry, it cools a lot faster. So the conditional instability means it's in between the two. So the air layer is stable for unsaturated, but unstable for saturated. All right, so I've got a dry piece of air. There's not much moisture in it at all, all right? It's stable for that, but unstable for saturated air parcels, all right? It can be unstable because it is releasing the latent heat. So this is a graph you can take a closer look at uh, in the notes later. But the air layer is absolutely stable when a few things happen. The temperature of the ambient air drops more slowly with altitude than the moist adiabatic lapse rate. The temperature doesn't change with altitude or the temperature increases with altitude. So the thing about this, if it's absolutely stable, that means that the temperature maybe two or three thousand feet above the ground is warmer than on the ground. It doesn't happen a lot. I mean, most of the time we think, yeah, the air, the air cools as you go up. But if the atmosphere is stable, all right, the air temperature higher up is actually a little bit warmer. And this happens a lot. This is a perfect situation. This is when we get ice in the winter where the ground is actually colder than the air three or four to three or four thousand feet above. That's a very stable atmosphere. Um, a few more examples of this. A lifting process in terms of saturating some air. The ascending branch of a, of a convection current. In other words, think about summertime air rising rapidly to form a thunderstorm. It's still rapid. It's to, it still cools, forms clouds and thunderstorms. Uh, similarly, Air going up the top over the front side of a mountain, that's going up a slope. Or if you've got winds converging from two different directions. Sometimes close to the ground level, you have wind from the west and the southwest. So they're kind of coming together and converging. And when they converge, there's going to be a little bit of a lift. And that lift will send the air up. It will cool a little bit and become saturated and form clouds. We see that a lot with frontal zones. You might have heard warm fronts, cold fronts, those kinds of things. Those are areas where the air is being lifted. Uh, clouds of precipitation triggered by that uplift. A front is just a narrow zone of, of transition between two different air masses. We talked about the, the continental polar, maritime tropical. These two air masses bumping into one another, different densities, have different amounts of, of of moisture in them they have different temperatures so they don't mix particularly well it's almost like oil and water and it forces one over top of the other in fact the top um, photograph there or image there shows you the warm air running over top of the relatively cool air and that's what gives us this this longer term precipitation sometimes called stratiform precipitation uh, it's not very violent all right it's because this long drawn out rain so the, the warm air is advancing and the cold air is actually retreating a little bit, all going from, from, from left to right there. But in the bottom is, is a cold front. Remember cold, uh, it's, it's typically going to have 
less moisture, it's going to be denser, and as it moves forward into warmer air, all right, it forces the air up much more dramatically. So there's more rapid ascent of the air, there's more rapid condensation, there's more rapid cloud formation, and ultimately more rapid precipitation because your cold air is advancing. So the top one, you've got cold air retreating. The bottom, you've got cold air advancing. Uh, other ways to lift or graphic lifting, that's basically, again, the air is being forced up a mountain. So it cools, expands, forms clouds, sometimes precipitation. The reverse happens as that air comes down the other side. It compresses and warms. Relative humidity drops and the sun comes out. So which clouds are which? What's the difference between clouds with liquid water? What's the difference with clouds with ice crystals? And, and what are some that, that have both? So again, to remember, clouds are a product of a condensation, sometimes deposition of water vapor within the atmosphere, water droplets and or ice crystals. To get clouds to form, to get condensation to happen, you have to have some impurities in the atmosphere. All right, the water vapor doesn't just up and condense by itself. It needs some kind of impurity in the atmosphere to condense around. And it's called a cloud condensation nuclei or CCN. It's something for the molecules to grab hold of and then start forming water droplets around or ice crystals around, snowflakes. All right, you need some kind of impurity, a little piece of dust, a little piece of smoke, something like that, all right? For the water vapor, once it, it loses enough energy to go from vapor to liquid, or sometimes ice, it needs something to kind of form on. And that's what the CCN is. So if you don't get the temperature, um, if you don't have something in the atmosphere for that cloud condensation nucleus to, if you don't have a, an, impur, an impurity in the atmosphere for the water vapor to condense on, you could still have super cooled liquid water droplets. So, for example, you can have liquid water that's 30, 29, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. If you don't have sufficient nuclei to form ice crystals, you can still have super cooled water droplets. So when we think about the, the type of, of clouds, uh, we have, we say cold and warm. When we say cold and warm, we're talking about relative to ice versus liquid. So the, the cold clouds are ones that have ice crystals or super cooled water droplets. Warm clouds have water droplets that are above the freezing point. When we classify them, we give them names. They are, they're based on appearance, old Greek names. Uh, cirrus clouds are wispy. Stratiform clouds are, are kind of in layers, stratus being layers. Cumuliform clouds are hefty, puffy big billowing kinds of clouds and and based on altitude high middle and low clouds and clouds having a lot of vertical development meaning they're they're going up not necessarily flat or or in a lateral a lateral direction so this is the the classic grouping of them the classical uh cloud classifications uh the high clouds generally start with the zero or cirrus prefix uh, cirrus clouds, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus. We don't get a lot of cirrocumulus. Um, we get a lot of cirrostratus. Cirrocumulus are kind of like little bumpy clouds, very, very high up in the sky. Uh, but they're all cirrostrat, cirrocumulus still come under the, the definition of cirrus clouds, which are more than 5,000 meters up uh, into the atmosphere, you know, 15,000 feet or higher. Uh, the middle clouds tend to be between about 2,000 and 5,000 meters. So think about six to 15,000 feet. And they come, they start with the prefix alto, meaning middle. Alto stratus, which are flat. Alto cumulus, which means they're a little bubbly, 
but at that level up into the troposphere. And then the low clouds are anywhere from the ground up to about 6,000 feet, 2,000 meters. Uh, stratus clouds, stratocumulus clouds. Stratocumulus are, are, are flat with like little bumps on them. And nimbostratus clouds are just, those are the very low clouds where, where you tend to get a, that stratiform or, or long log area, large areas of rain. Fog is a cloud. It's a cloud that's sitting on the ground. It's a stratus cloud that's basically sitting on the ground. Um, for the most part, it's liquid water droplets. You can have ice fog, but most of the time it's just liquid water droplets. And it can form in a variety of ways. There's radiation fog, advection, steam, upslope. Radiation fog basically just means the ground has gotten has cooled off overnight, that we've hit saturation, and fogs form. Advection fog means you've brought in moisture from somewhere else into a relatively cool air mass. So you've raised the moisture content into a cool air mass. So you have condensation and fog. Steam fog is oftentimes seen over large bodies of water. This time of year, uh, very cold air over warm water. Think about cold air over the Great Lakes. You can get steam fog or upslope fog. Again, you have water, you have uh, air going up a mountain, condensing to form clouds or fog, and we get that a lot, especially into the mountains in, in nearby West Virginia. So then how do we get that liquid and solid out of the sky? That's, uh, that's, that's precipitation. When the solid or liquid that falls from the clouds under gravity, in other words, there's enough gravity that starts to pull that stuff back down to the ground, that's precipitation. You know, if you've got clouds, you've got a little bit of upward motion because you've got rising air that's cooling and forming clouds. So you start to get little bits of ice crystals, little bits of water droplets suspended in the air because there's a little rising air and the droplets are so small and the snowflakes or ice crystals are so small, the gravity is not pulling on them enough. That's why the clouds are just hanging there. But after a while, that stuff adds up and the solid or liquid begins to become heavy enough to fall back down to the ground in the form of precipitation. The, the two main ways this forms is, is one warm cloud precipitation. And by warm, we mean above freezing, uh, where the temperatures are above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The droplets will start to bump into each other. These tiny water droplets start to bump into each other, and they grow. That's called collision and coalescence. They bump and they coalesce, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until they're finally big enough where they fall out of the cloud. The cold version of this, where their temperatures below the freezing port, contain ice crystals. And this is called the bergeron findison process, or Bergeron for short. Once you've got ice crystals, snowflakes, uh, in a cloud, and liquid, liquid water droplets, super cool water droplets, uh, in a saturated cloud, snow or ice crystals start to form. And then the ice crystals grow at the expense of the water droplets because you've got super cooled you've got liquid water that's below the freezing point so the ice crystals are basically a form of condensation nuclei so the liquid water drops like oh look there's something i can grab hold to boom and the ice crystal starts to grow because you're below the freezing point so snowflakes ice crystals grow at the expense of super cooled water droplets And this is another version of that. So as you start to get condensation and deposition in the middle of a cloud, you get super cooled water droplets and ice crystals known as snowflakes. As they start to bounce around a little bit, the snowflakes, if you want to think of it this way, they start to eat away at some of the super cooled water droplets because the, the ice crystals are bigger than the water droplets for one thing. So they're, almost kind of scouring out in the cloud, uh, the water droplets. 
you know, most of the time when we get rain, it's 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 from snow that's melted higher up into the atmosphere, right? So ultimately, these ice crystals grow, fall out of the cloud, and by the time they get closer to the ground here, they've melted, and then we get rain. Now, sometimes we said before, if the winds are at different directions at different different altitudes. You can have snow fall and then melt and then refreeze on the way back down. That's how we get ice. And that happens in the winter. It's happened a lot this winter, right? But that's more of a, how is the temperature changing through the depth of the atmosphere? Almost all wintertime precipitation starts as snow. There is a, a definable difference between rain and drizzle. Sometimes we think of drizzle as just very light rain, but rain is actually liquid water drops that have a certain diameter, at least half a millimeter, right? Drizzle, the droplets are much smaller. They're less than half a millimeter and they don't fall as fast because they're smaller. They're almost like a mist. They just kind of hang, hang there. And they form lower in a cloud base than, than rain. You know, rain is, is snow that melts on the way down. Drizzle almost always forms as a liquid much lower in the cloud. Not always, but but most of the time. Snow, of course, is just the, I love this word, agglomeration. It's the combination of ice crystals in the form of flakes. All right, so snow is an ice crystal. It's a pretty ice crystal, but it's an ice crystal. And by the way, there's several several shapes of snowflakes that are all those, those pretty six-sided dendrites that you see. You get a lot of ice crystals that aren't quite that pretty. Uh, that are still technically snow. Ice pellets, also known as sleet, are, are tiny little balls of ice that are falling from the sky. And that's wintertime precipitation. All right. Again, you've got snow falling, melting, and then refreezing. And it refreezes into a little ball of ice. You're not going to go from a liquid water drop to a snowflake again on the way down. All right. You're going to go to the little ball of ice. Freezing rain is rain until it touches something and then freezes. Big difference between freezing rain and sleet. All right. Freezing rain or freezing drizzle, both liquid, stay liquid until they touch something and then freeze. So it freezes on contact with the cold surface. In this case, we mean cold is below the freezing point. Hail comes from thunderstorms. In wintertime, we don't have hail. Wintertime, we have sleet. Summertime, you have hail. All right, that's ice that is forming within a thunderstorm. Remember, thunderstorms go five, six miles up into the sky, really high. All right, so you have these huge currents inside of thunderstorms, very high up in the sky. You've got water droplets going up and down, up and down, above freezing, below freezing, above freezing, below freezing, until finally um, becomes heavy enough where it falls out the cloud, and that's hail. So it's a ball of ice, like sleet, but hail forms in several layers. Um, so it's a little bit different in the way it forms versus sleet. There's a few more schematics of how that happens. Uh, the temperatures required for the formation of, of uh, snow, sleet, freezing rain, and rain. Again, if we look here at the top, everything starts as snow. This area here with the blue dots are showing you areas that are above the freezing point. So you have air that's coming in, let's say from the south, I don't know, three, four, five thousand feet above the ground. That's 35, 36, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. That snow melts and it's liquid. And if the only part of the atmosphere is that's a below freezing is is close to the ground here, then you have freezing rain. It stays liquid till it touches something. If you have a little more distance between the uh, the freezing layer and the ground, then you get sleet, which is shown there by the by the triangles. Triangle is the uh, is the uh, the weather is the weather symbol for sleet. You can measure precipitation through rain gauges. Um, there are a couple ways to do this. One is the classic uh, 
cylinder, another is a tipping bucket. Uh, the tipping bucket normally does about one one hundredth of an inch of liquid, and then it automatically tips. I mean, once it fills up, it tips, and it triggers the electronic device so we can measure electronically how much rain has fallen, as opposed to the, the classical cylinder, which you've got to kind of look in and measure with a ruler. So there's the, the weighing bucket versus the standard rain gauge with the guys who basically you just stick a, 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 you stick a, um, a ruler in there and measure how much rain you've got. There are ways to do this remotely. They're not as good uh, in terms of measuring how much is on the ground, how much rain reach or snow reaches the ground. But weather radar does tell us where the precipitation is falling. Uh, the weather radar works by sending out a little pulse of microwave energy and sees what bounces back. And these are all ground-based uh, little towers. They're not done from, from orbit, from low Earth orbit or satellites. These are, are relatively close to the ground. They're on towers that are a couple hundred feet up, but they're certainly not up in orbit or anything like that. So you've got a real weather radar that spins. It sends out a little pulse of energy in the microwave part of the spectrum. It's fairly low energy, so you're not going to get fried unless you're right next to it. Uh, and then whatever bounces back. You know, the strength of that return echo tells us how much precipitation is out there. And then we can color code it however we want. And that's the these classic things like you'll see on a radar app. All right, the higher reflectivities are in these yellows and reds. The lower reflectivities are in these blues and greens. And places where you've got no reflectivity, you've got no precipitation, there's there's nothing here at all. You just see this is just the terrain, the map itself. And now satellite sensors will help us a little bit, but they're not going to be nearly as good as ground-based uh, ground sensing, the radars. So that's a quick overview uh, of water moving in and around and out of the atmosphere. Next time, we'll look at the global atmospheric circulation. You'll hear things like Hadley cells, the doldrums, the trade winds, all those kinds of things are part of the global atmospheric circulation. So we'll talk about that next time.